Welcome back to Building Tomorrow, a show about new technology and the ways it's making us freer, happier, and more prosperous. That is, if we don't screw it up. I'm Paul Matsko, and I'm sitting here with Aaron Powell and Matthew Feeney. Picture this with me. You're an aspiring dictator who has just rigged the election and rewritten the constitution of a petrostate. You are, as someone in your shoes is wont to do, reviewing the troops to distract the starving public from blaming you for their plight. As you give a completely forgettable speech, suddenly, blam, an explosion in the sky just a few hundred feet away. What's happened? Apparently, you're the target of the first attempted assassination by drone of the head of, of a head of state. Congratulations. Now, anyone who follows international news has probably picked up that I was talking about Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela. Someone, and Maduro blamed a rebel conspiracy of some kind, uh, bought a $5,000 commercial grade photography drone, strapped a block of C4 to it, and detonated it along the parade route, injuring seven soldiers. Now, Matthew, you're our kind of in-house drone specialist. Uh-huh. What's your take? What, what does the Maduro drone mean? Is it, is it, was it really an assassination attempt? And what's the broader significance? Yeah, my first reaction watching some of the video of this, uh, which is not actually on policy, is that, that after the explosion, a couple of his bodyguards run around him with these what look like bulletproof blankets. And I think that has to be one of the worst jobs in the world. <laughs> you hear an explosion around Maduro and you're supposed to cover him with these blankets. Anyway, um, I do pity a lot of people in that country, the bodyguards um, included. Uh, so this is an interesting story, right? Uh, and... I suppose in in looking at threats uh, associated with drones, this kind of thing was a a when, not an if. Uh, people have been worrying about uh, people attaching explosives to drones and using them for assassinations or attacks on uh, buildings, airplanes, you name it. Uh, now, two things strike me about this particular uh, story. One is that this seems like a bad way to assassinate a head of state uh, mm, given why is that? the uh because uh the number one the technology is rather expensive like this stuff costs $5000 and uh requires a bit of training like not a lot but uh, a little bit and uh, you have to be quite good at flying these kind of things to go straight at a target from that distance i mean th- this thing uh, exploded quite a way away from where Maduro was standing. It was certainly within his eyesight, but it doesn't look as if it got anywhere close, actually, to doing it. Uh, and then there was another drone blocks away uh, that looks identical that also exploded and just fell down. So it seems, like, pretty incompetent, right? Uh, and it seems to me, and again, I'm not a foreign policy expert and not a, a security, a, a personal security expert, but uh, it seems at least to me, unlikely that this was uh, funded by a, a government, that this was a government-sponsored assassination attempt. Now, could be wrong about that. It's not, uh, we should ask Juan Carlos, our Latin American expert here at Cato, what he thinks. Uh, but the second thing that strikes me about this is that uh, this kind of thing is uh, not going to go away and will probably improve, if anything. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it, it's something we should probably be worried about, something that uh, is going... Drones are a tool like a lot of others that can be utilized for good things uh, and bad. Uh, and we should certainly put uh, these, these kind of threats uh, on the table for things that we should consider. But uh, at the moment, fortunately, this kind of attack is uh, relatively rare. Why is it rare, or I guess, why did it take this long for it to finally happen? Because these, I mean, we've had drone technology for a while, uh-huh. and they've been commercially available for a long time, and clearly, lots of people are able to get their hands on explosives. And we've been we've been panicking at the prospect of terrorists loading up drones and raining death from the sky, and you know, our cities filled with these things, mm-hmm. killing everyone and everything. But it doesn't seem to have happened. And as you said, this this first instance, which seems much later than the panic that preceded it, mm-hmm. um, was fairly inept. It didn't look like it even came close to working. So is that is that a sign that these fears that we might have had are somewhat misplaced? I think they're misplaced. At the, I think it's not uh, worth worrying about this sort of thing happening on a day-to-day basis now. Uh, it's something we should keep an eye on as a future threat. Uh, this is uh, something that will, unfortunately, I think, become 
more common. At the moment, it's rare uh, because uh, I mean I don't know where where Aaron hangs out, but at least I find it difficult to get my hands on explosives like the sort of like C four that uh, was attached to these drones. So you need I wouldn't a, know how to do it, but just you look around the world. <laughs> there are lots of places in the world where lots of people seem to be able impossible. to get there. So you you want to this became a very ghoulish conversation. So you want to assassinate a head of state, right? And there are a couple <laughs> of ways you can do it. It seems that. Buying a drone that costs thousands of dollars and then finding C4 explosives and then finding someone who can is willing to be within range of the drone while flying it to kill someone uh, who also knows how to detonate the explosives, uh, who also – it seems like there's so many barriers to – really quite technical. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And again, certainly – definitely not uh, with – uh, that's certainly something that's within the scope of um, governments to do, uh, yeah. which is why I think this is probably uh, a, some sort of non-government attempt. Uh, I don't think it's uh, – not that I've seen anyone seriously suggest this, but I just want to put it out there. Uh, this seems so uh, cypherpunk and futuristic that I don't think it's a Venezuelan like false flag attempt or anything. Like that it seems a little bonkers uh, to do that. Again, uh, we should maybe ask some of our foreign policy colleagues about that, but uh, it's – what we have seen with drone technology, right, is uh, rapid Im- improvement, yeah. uh, and uh, these the the range that these things uh, can fly within, and uh, the amounts of uh, load that they can carry, uh, will make these risks more pronounced. Well, and, and to your point about a, a certain level of technical expertise being required and not being on display in Venezuela, well, the second drone, which appears to have been identical to the first one, it mm-hmm. just ran into an apartment building and fell to the ground and exploded yeah. you know, 14 seconds later or something. But mm-hmm. like, it, it's always a problem when your assassin drone just runs into apartment buildings because he didn't fly it right. That's right. You, you, so again, the, and the technology, to Aaron, your point, the technology has been there. I mean, it, it's fancy to call these things drones, but a drone, we've had flying, hovering, small aircraft capability for... 25 when years. I was in fifth grade, I really wanted an RC helicopter. Yeah. And in fact, the uh, the Japanese terrorist group, um, I'm, I hope I'm saying this right, Om um, Shinriko, the one that released the sarin gas in the subways, they actually, before they did the whole subway method, they were experimenting with using uh, a helicopter, one of those small RC helicopters with a little sprayer to spray sarin gas from the skies. Mm-hmm. Like they ha- we, the difference between that and the quadricopter is really kind of marginal. Other than the, the RC helicopter requiring line of sight, whereas really our, our drones these days you can do from farther away, right? You can right. with a little camera on it. But that's a relatively incremental change. And it's not like anyone threw a, flew an RC helicopter into a head of state and, and blew them up. Again, it's possible. And again, with drone technology, it makes you're able to carry more weight. So C4, rather than a little syringe with an ounce of sarin gas in it, it's able to go farther and farther. It's easier and easier to use. So it lowers the barrier to that kind of like terroristic uh, uh, threat. But it's all more incremental. And I think a lot of the paranoia tends to be, you know, within with any moment now, we're going to have swarms of terrorist controlled drones in the skies. There's this uh, uh, video that I watched called Slaughterbots, which is a great name for like a, maybe a knockoff 80s kids show. And then like not Transformers, but for an older audience, Slaughterbots or something. But the 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 video is all about it, – it's by this institute that's worried about like existential tech threats. So the singularity or things like that. And uh, – but it's quite dramatic where you'll have swarms of, of drones, assassin drones, uh, dropped out of the back of an airplane. They will use facial recognition to hunt down – individual people so there's this whole dramatic scene where a kid's on the phone with his mom while the hunt, the tracker drone comes and stalks him and kills him and the lion goes dead now again like it's a terrifying prospect but it the idea of that being I, I think of the level of technical expertise the amount of of money planning that goes into a terroristic operation like that yeah. it, it, the way you catch that is not really by worrying about the tech per se. It's by tracking all the human work that goes into setting up something like that. Yeah. Uh, I hope that we can put the the link to this video in the show notes. Yeah, we'll uh, to, yeah. I, uh, before, for prepping, I took a look at this video uh, that Paul's talking about. And uh, yeah, I think it would make a good uh, – I watched it and thought it would make a great uh, Black Mirror oh, yeah. episode. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. just something in those vein. Uh, and actually, it's not – 
that in that video, they're not talking just about terrorists using it, but rather this is the way the military could drop hundreds of these drones over a, a city, and it would these drones would just fly around and just kill terrorists, uh, utilizing facial recognition, right? Uh, we are a long way from this at the moment, right? Uh, not least, you know, you have to worry about the battery life of these things. Uh, facial recognition is uh, not up to spec, especially on tiny little drones like that. Uh, I don't know if you can carry enough gunpowder on a tiny drone like that to actually kill someone. Uh, again, not a ammunition expert. But I think that new technologies being utilized uh, as weapons is something we're used to and i think you're right to say the 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 worry should be not with the tech per se but rather with the utilization of it um there have been coalitions around the world to you know ban killer robots and to draw the line at um, artificial intelligence being used uh not just with drones but other weapon systems and it seems to me that that's uh, – those kind of campaigns, while I might quibble with details, uh, campaigns like that are the right sort of approach to tech change because I don't think we want to come across as technophobes, right? Like that, I don't fear uh, technological advances. So there will certainly be uh, incidents that we should put in the cost column when it comes to the development of new technology. But uh, I, I have spoken and written about facial recognition and drones for a while here at Cato, and uh, Lord knows I'm worried about uh, how this technology could be used to uh, erode our freedom and our privacy. But in in Libertopia, right, in a world where there's certain um, oversight uh, and there's uh, – good regulations in place, uh, facial recognition is quite an exciting technology. And so are drones. Uh, I know we started the conversation with a bit of a, a depressing note, but the idea of, of drones being able to uh, coordinate rescue efforts or to deliver medical supplies to people, uh, perform search and rescue, you know, they're, they're exciting and useful uh, applications of this technology, but we should also be wary of the uh, rather disturbing features as well. Yeah. And perhaps, I mean, you can make a pretty good argument that a lot of that most paranoid scenario in our, you know, slaughter bots future is stuff we're already doing, right? I mean, we already have predator drones that will circle a town and, you know, in, in Iraq or in Syria and shoot someone just because, you know, they're able to identify that they're carrying a weapon and therefore it's assumed they're combatant. I mean, we're already doing that kind of thing. Yeah. So, and and notably... Who tend, who tend to be the bad actors in the scenarios. It's state actors more often than not. Yeah, but I think that uh, is an example of uh, uh, yeah, an, an application of this technology that we, we are not happy with, right? But uh, in – <laughs> Again, in in a world perhaps run by libertarians, like I don't object prima facie, right, to uh, the United States having uh, predator drones that can fire missiles with a lot of accuracy, uh, and that puts very few Americans' lives at risk. Like, it sounds like a good weapon. It's now, not in of itself, right? In and yeah. of itself. So, if we fight a war against a state actor, you know, a fleet of predator B drones seems like a worthwhile way to take out, say a certain country's tanks or its airfields or other aircraft, right? Uh, the, the the way it's been used in the this never-ending war on terror raises tons and tons of really serious uh, uh, humanitarian uh, questions uh, that, that should concern all of us. But uh, I don't object necessarily to predator drones being used, right, in warfare. Um, I do object, right, to the fact that a lot of military technology like this comes home in the context of domestic law enforcement or border security. So CBP has some of these predator drones. Uh, they're not outfitted with Hellfire missiles, but they do come with very sophisticated surveillance technology. And the first uh, instance in the United States of uh, an American citizen being arrested, uh, thanks in part to drone surveillance, was in fact police, I believe, in North Dakota uh, borrowing a CBP drone like this. Uh, and America has a history of aerial surveillance uh, and the technology is improving. And we're now at the stage where the kind of technology we're used to seeing in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq is coming home for uh, mm -hmm. the men in blue. Mm -hmm. And now maybe when you see those signs on the highway that say speed will be checked by airplane, it might actually be real and not just a – right. Yeah. <laughs> I always, you see those and you know that you're going to get away with speeding. The signs always say um, speed limit enforced yeah, by aircraft, which seems far more threatening yeah. than yeah. monitored. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 
I also I wonder how much of the the murder bot scenario assumes a lack of kind of cultural shifts too that mitigate against this. So so facial recognition is if if we end up in a world where there are drones flying all over the place that are seeking out people to kill through facial recognition, and so you live in a city where that's happening, there are put on a hoodie, you know, like there's people people can adapt, and we don't. I mean, it's not great to have to live in a world where everyone wears a hoodie or some facial recognition <laughs> spoofing thing, but you know, like or or culturally, people just shoot down drones whenever they hear them. You know, like it it seems like these kind of a lot of these scenarios depend on and this is the problem with a lot of predicting the effects of future technologies is they depend on everything but this technological change remaining static and that there won't be shifts to it. Um, and and I can imagine that there might be shifts that would mitigate against a lot of these problems if and when it becomes a real problem. Yeah. Well, and I would add to this that there's a we there is a natural i think human tendency to overrate the effects of technology itself as almost the an agent in these scenarios and de-emphasize the role of humans and of culture i think as as Aaron's speaking to here so you know there was a wave i mean the the, the first wave of modern terrorism is the late 19th century there's a wave of anarchists uh, who decide to take out heads of state and so you have you have bombings you have people using pistols Killing, you know, everyone from czars to holy, you know, to uh, the, the Austro-Hungarian emperor. I mean, right. So you have this wave of assassinations, but none of that tech was new, mm-hmm. right? So it's you had the tech, and no one was there was not a mass wave of assassinations of heads of state. The worst case scenarios until something happened, a cultural shift, a change. It was it was people and society and culture that used those tools to you know, questionable ends. And so you spend more time worrying about the political economy, about people, about culture and society, less time worrying about the technology per se, um, though keeping awareness of how it can be used and misused. So, uh, but I think on something, Matthew, you, were, you led us to the use of drone tech in domestic surveillance. Mm-hmm. Um, so they caught that guy in North Dakota a few years ago. Um, now, there, there was this one court case I saw uh, mentioned in some of the material, Florida v. Riley. Yeah. Uh, explain a little bit. How does that apply to drone surveillance potentially? Right. So uh, some listeners might already be familiar with the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. But uh, the, <laughs> for those who don't, uh, the Fourth Amendment uh, – Just pretend Jeff Sessions is listening <laughs> telling him yeah. about it. Right. OK, Jeff. Um, <laughs> so uh, the Fourth Amendment states, right, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures should not be violated. So that's part of the amendment. Uh, it goes on to talk about particular warrants. And uh, this is one of the amendments where you can find the value of privacy, right? Uh, and – as as sometimes happens at the court, uh, the court eventually had to deal with a Fourth Amendment question related to a new technology or a emerging technology. So the Supreme Court uh, has throughout its history dealt with Fourth Amendment questions related to thermal scanners, smartphones, GPS trackers. And uh, Florida v. Riley was a case uh, where the court was presented with the question, is the warrantless aerial surveillance of someone's backyard from a helicopter at 400 feet, a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, it's a 1989 case. And what's interesting, it's the the last of a trinity of cases from the 80s dealing with aerial surveillance. There's also a Dow Chemical case and uh, a case called uh, Sorallo, uh, California v. Sorallo, or Sorallo v. California. I forget. <laughs> it's someone forget. someone. Right. <laughs> uh, and what's interesting about these cases are ah, that the Supreme Court uh, has has held that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy to the contents of your backyard as observed from the air. Uh, and therefore, the police do not need a warrant to conduct such a search, right? Uh, the Sorallo case I mentioned dealt with airplane surveillance at 1,000 feet and the uh, Florida v. Riley case was a helicopter at 400 feet. It will come as no shock to this audience that in both cases, uh, Sorallo and Riley, they, the police were looking for marijuana. Uh, and uh, this is still 
a good precedent today. Uh, the Supreme Court has not considered drone surveillance. So as it stands, uh, police do not need a warrant to observe your private property from the air uh, with a drone. However, some states have gone beyond that precedent. I think it's about a dozen states have passed a warrant requirement for drone surveillance. Uh, but the Supreme Court standard is that police don't need a warrant to uh, observe your private property from the air. What I like about Florida v. Riley as a case is it includes a really prescient uh, dissent from Justice Brennan, who wrote uh, in 1989, he says something like, uh, imagine a helicopter capable of generating no noise, but hovering just above the patio, and it doesn't generate any noise at all. Uh, would we say that this doesn't run afoul of the Fourth Amendment? And it's, uh, it's one example in Supreme Court history of justices uh, predicting the future, right? And Brennan is really talking about what we today call drones. Uh, so the, the, the sad reality is that uh, police in most of the country uh, don't need to secure a, a warrant or anything like that to, to observe someone's backyard. Uh, one day, the court, I'm sure, will deal with drone surveillance, uh, but uh, the state of affairs is not particularly satisfying. Now, I'm I'm curious in how this interacts with, I know there was a Supreme Court case recently essentially saying police had to get a warrant to track your cell pings to a tower. Yeah. So yeah. it's another way for the police to warrantlessly or, or was until recently to warrantlessly surveil, to track you as you go about your daily business. The Supreme Court, my understanding is said, you know, tisk tisk, you can't do that without a warrant. But isn't this kind of the same? I mean, it's a different tech. Yeah. cell phone towers versus drone surveillance. But is the basic Fourth Amendment problem the same? How are these going to – are they in conflict? How is this going to be resolved? Well, the case you're referring to is uh, the Carpenter decision that was announced earlier this year. And that question involved the police using cell phone location data uh, in order to identify the whereabouts of suspects who had committed a string of armed robberies. And they – got this uh, cell site location information uh, without a warrant uh, thanks to the so-called third party doctrine where, which states you give up any privacy rights uh, or interests in information you volunteer to a third party. Uh, so they, they track the suspect for 127 days, I believe, uh, and they secure a conviction. Uh, Carpenter uh, says uh, th this, this collection, warrantless collection, violates uh, his Fourth Amendment rights. And here the court came out, I think, in the, the right side, but it's a very, very narrow decision. So uh, to sum it up, the, the court found that uh, tracking someone's physical location using cell site location information for a week violates your reasonable expectation of privacy to your physical location. <laughs> okay. um, it does not address uh, license plate trackers or s traditional CCTV cameras or facial recognition or anything else. It's a relatively narrow yeah. decision. Now, it's the right um, outcome, it seems to me. But uh, if you're worried about aerial surveillance, Carpenter it has doesn't to do help it. you. Okay. Uh, and that d that's not to say that it won't one day. Uh, a, a few years ago, or maybe last year, there was reporting about uh, Baltimore uh, police utilizing uh, uh, an airplane that would uh, just fly around Baltimore, uh, keeping the city under uh, under constant surveillance. Uh, this was a uh, a technology uh, owned by the unambiguously named Persistent Surveillance Systems Company, uh, and the developer of this technology has described it as Google Earth with TiVo. That you basically have the entire city or most of the city of Baltimore um, and the police call up and say, hey, there was a, a robbery at 123 Smith Street and you just find out um, who was there and you can track whoever mm. left uh, back home. Uh, and the developer of this uh, technology, which by the way was used without the knowledge of uh, the mayor, uh, the <laughs> governor, uh, Maryland's congressional delegation, uh, he rightly said, you know, uh, that, look, uh, this doesn't run afoul of any Supreme Court precedent, right? Um, and so that's the situation we're in. Uh, that's it. I don't think we should have to wait for the Supreme Court to deal with this issue. Uh, there are there are local legislatures that can address this. Uh, but we should we should be aware of the state of the technology. Uh, the, the Baltimore situation was very expensive. 
Uh, it was, from what I understand, funded by some billionaire philanthropist, right? It's pretty expensive. Human beings from this plane aren't identifiable. They show up like a pixel. Uh, but the military uh, has surveillance, uh, aerial surveillance equipment that's pretty intrusive. Mm. Uh, the uh, the military seems to be very fond of acronyms. Uh, there's one surveillance, <laughs> uh, one uh, drone surveillance uh, program or, or technology called Argus. Uh, and for those of you who are into uh, ancient mythology, Argus is the, uh, the mythological dog, right? yeah. or the hundred-eyed giant. Oh, right? giant. So I think okay. you're thinking Argo, Odysseus's dog. I was Argus. thinking about the dog that watches the entrance to to, to Hades. Hades, or, Hades or, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is uh, so Argus, right? The the hundred-eyed giant. Um, and it stands for uh, autonomous, uh, autonomous real time ground ubiquitous imaging system, uh, and this can that's which, pretty you know, good. It's I mean, pretty it pops good. A person who, Seriously, it's not yeah. bad. Uh, and it it can keep uh, something like twenty five square miles under persistent surveillance and has something like six inch six inch resolution, right? Uh, but that's military gear. But again, that the technology is improving, so we should be prepared for when that sort of stuff yeah. comes um, to the home front. In that Carpenter decision, so it was a, as you said, a rather narrower constrained in how much it, how far it actually reaches. Mm -hmm. um, but was there anything like reading between the lines in dicta that indicates what direction the court was thinking as far as when this stuff inevitably gets, comes up again or similar situations come up again? Uh, thinking back on the, the writings with the justices, there was – uh, the chief justice who wrote the majority was uh, took great pains to be clear that uh, this did not impact uh, traditional surveillance. Uh, and uh, it's been a while since I read, uh, but I, I'm not aware of uh, them pontificating about a lot of future technologies, which I suppose is appropriate. You know, you don't want to show your hand. I know that Justice Sotomayor in the past has mentioned drones. Uh, I think at public events is something that she's a little concerned about. Uh, and yeah uh i i given my analysis i suppose of fourth amendment cases over the last 10 years i think there's probably enough justices on the court that would be sufficiently creeped out by what we saw in baltimore uh now just because you're creeped out by something doesn't mean it's unconstitutional right uh, i think you know judges have to look at this um uh with with cold hard stares right uh, but as I said earlier, we, we shouldn't have to wait for the court. Uh, there are legislatures in the country that can address this issue before um, the judicial branch. Well, my impression uh, as we talk about this is that it's somewhat similar to uh, uh, the logic we were using in responding to assassin drones, which is to suggest that, again, the tech itself isn't the primary problem here, it's how it's being employed by who and, and with what constraints. Yeah. So like with the Baltimore situation, that information was all proprietary and it was done without the permission of, of let alone the transparency of the local government. And so like it's a problem if you have a, a data set being collected that you can't submit a FOIA request for, that law enforcement is using without warrants mm -hmm. to arrest people. Because then if you're the, if you're the attorney for the defendant, you, you, are you going to get access to those records? Will journalists be able to submit FOIA requests to get access to abuses of this technology? But that's that's not necessarily the technology's fault. That's people not. Yeah, uh, and, and the reporting on the Baltimore situation really did emphasize to me that I think the guy running the company was just really misjudged how this would be perceived. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If I recall correctly, he invited. Uh, Jay Stanley from the ACLU to just like come along and take a look and we'll see and you know I think yeah. Jay was a little taken aback by what he by what he saw uh, and was told and uh, you know and and I believe you know the guy who who runs this company seems like a nice guy and he says look you know we only are using this to pursue uh, violent crimes and who could possibly object to you know surveillance technology that's catching murderers and and I get that and by the way I believe him uh, the problem is. Uh, I'm worried about the other people, not just him. But uh, that's that's not law. That's government policy. That's just the policy that they're following. Uh, and anyone who's listened to not just me, but my colleagues uh, Patrick Eddington and Julian Sanchez knows that the history of American surveillance reveals a long and diverse list of suspects. And the fact is that if a 
piece of aerial surveillance technology can track where a murderer lives. It can track where gun owners live, where people who go to Alcoholics Anonymous live. Uh, they can track uh, where people who attend certain religious organizations uh, yeah. live. And that's that's the worry. And I think what Aaron mentioned earlier is really interesting because it might be the case that enough of the population says, you know what, I, I don't uh, mind really having uh, persistent drones in the air that are just filming everything. Uh, and maybe we'll just either get used to that or uh, there'll be different kind of norms that emerge that people find ways to transport themselves uh, in, in ways that obscure them from the, the ever-present eye in the sky. Uh, I mean, you know. I just think of the the long history of teenagers figuring out all sorts of clever ways to obfuscate all their behaviors from their parents. Yeah. And like this we're good will, at this sort of stuff. This, I can imagine parking lots being full of teenagers coming underground to swap cars and to try and figure <laughs> out how to you know do all this. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, um, what I do worry about though is something we saw in the wake of the, the Snowden revelations where – you had people uh, in surveys conducted by Pew, but also this is, by the way, a phenomenon that's also been studied uh, using Google searches and Wikipedia uh, searches. Uh, totally lawful behavior um, is stifled. You know, First Amendment protected speech and queries are stifled. And I worry that maybe there is someone who's thinking of seeing a therapist or going to Alcoholics Anonymous or who wants to explore a new religion uh, or, I don't know, likes to go to strip clubs, right? I mean, all of this is legal and you can uh, – and yet, uh, if they live in a city where they know that they're under the constant view of uh, law enforcement, it's understandable, it seems to me, that people might uh, think twice about engaging in totally lawful activity like that. Yeah. It's a matter of time before, you know, uh, uh, the – ex-spouse of someone has access gets access to one of these databases and says ah look the the new the new partner went to a strip club and i'm gonna you know i mean the misuse of that material is is mm -hmm. a, a, a real potential now to turn to a slightly more um i guess positive take on the use of drones a lot of our stuff here has been oh no which ways are people going to misuse this technology yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a legitimate conversation to have um, I wanted to turn to some of the cool, exciting applications. Actually, I saw TechCrunch Disrupt a few weeks ago um, and some of the ways in which this stuff, apart from state, apart from the surveillance state, apart from national security, terrorists and the like, are going to make people's lives uh, better off, wealthier, more comfortable, more peaceful, more pleasant. Um, but before I get there, one of the, the funny things to me is as I was thinking through drone tech is that we developed this new technology – and arguably, the first consumer use of it was uh, to take – and it's cool. The potential is fascinating, right? Are we going to have drones deliver Amazon packages? Are we going to have drones uh, 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 pollinate our crops? And yes, yes, kill our enemies and all these other kind of f fascinating scenarios. But the first major mass consumer use is to take pictures at weddings, drone photography by wedding photographers. <laughs> That's always kind of funny to me that like – would anybody have predicted that with a science fiction author 40 years ago been like, we're going to get drones. The first thing we're going to use them for, take pictures of the bride, bridal party. You know, that's that's not what I would have expected. But that's, in fact, the drone that was used to try to assassinate Maduro is a drone that is primarily sold to wedding photographers. Uh, so there's there's kind of an irony there. But there was a lot of drone startups at TechCrunch Disrupt on Startup Alley. Everything from the, – they had a drone with a uh, sniffer attached that um, – they had trained it to detect a certain kind of alcohol, essentially, an right. alcohol product. And uh, so the idea is the drone will fly like an in industrial sites along pipes and sniff for leaks because if you know the wrong pipe leaks the wrong substance, and, you know, boom, and we're talking lots of uh, monetary and, and you know, human loss. So you can sniff – and these uh, drones are capable of detecting much more minute amounts – and they're, you know, than the human being is, and they're much more, uh, they're less likely to miss something. You know, they're going to be more rigorous than a, than a human detector. Um, you can imagine they had drones for like warehouse security. You have a drone that patrols. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper than, than having a, you know, human security guard or drones that do, um, actually Walmart just submitted a patent application for a bee-like drone with like sticky pollen collecting legs that will fly around and do targeted pollination, you know, like 
per each flower, it'll go to kind of like a bee. That's a little farther off in the future. But even now at TechCrunch Disrupt, they had um, – they, it's kind of like pollen bombing, but you have a drone fly over from a few feet above the you know the, the trees or the plants and drop a payload. Um, yeah. Not as efficient as bees, but given the crisis and disappearing bees, it's a way of addressing that problem. So like that's that's cool technology that will allow us to get fresh food more cheaply, make our industrial sites safer. You know, I mean like it will make our lives better in a in a hundred different ways that none of us are really thinking about. It's all kind of going on behind the scenes. It's not as sexy or as scary as something like out of a Black Mirror episode. Mm -hmm. But I came away from TechCrunch Disrupt disrupt, thinking it doesn't matter if any individual one of these companies fails or succeeds. There's just so much interest here and so much investment. It's happening. It's inevitable. It's going on right now. And I think uh, rather than fixating on the scary scenarios – you know, take come from the fact this technology right now is doing real human good and making our lives better. Oh yeah, I am. Uh, despite my tone, perhaps in this episode, you know, I'm a long term optimist on this technology. Right? I think it's really exciting and it's going to help a lot of people uh, provide a whole new field for interesting innovation and entrepreneurship, and uh, not just right with. Uh, wedding photographers and deliveries, but uh, life-saving applications uh, that when it comes to search and rescue or for helping coordinate responses to hurricanes and uh, other natural disasters, I I think drones have uh, huge uh, potential there. Uh, And uh, I'm really excited about the space. Uh, The the frustrating thing is uh, sitting in the United States that the FAA has been... uh, pretty uh, reluctant to let to get these things off the ground. Uh, it's, it's sort of sad, right, that Amazon, which is one of America's most, you know, largest and most famous companies, uh, had to uh, test its uh, delivery drone in England. Uh, and <laughs> wow. there's, a, there's another American drone company that uh, does medical deliveries, uh, but it's flown a lot of, uh, of these flights in Rwanda. I don't, I don't think they've done any in the United States. Uh, it's a very cautious regulatory body, right? Uh, and that's a shame uh, for, that there are places where uh, these companies can innovate and uh, conduct uh, test flights. It's uh, just a shame that it's not the United States. Well, here we can make a quick call back to episode nine about the chi- the transformation of, of China and adoption rates there where yeah, yeah. they're doing yeah. drone deliveries in villages, stuff that Amazon promised back in 2013 to be doing and we're not you – know, we're years away from and they're already doing that stuff in China. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the FAA would – so if all this awesome stuff starts happening, so we get full-on drone deliveries and medical supplies and things can get out in hurricanes and all that in other countries, how responsive is the FAA to feeling left out? I hope quite. Uh, and I, I want to be fair to the FAA that uh, in in the last – year or so there have been announcements that they are trying to be a bit more flexible when it comes to drone uh, to drone regulation and that's good it seems that uh, Elaine Chow the uh, secretary of transportation uh, she's she seems to have a good head on her shoulders when it comes to this stuff uh, but how how effective public outcry will be uh, about this particular technology, I think, remains to be seen because it's one of these classic seen and unseen, right? So in the wake of Hurricane Florence, we haven't seen a lot of drones flying around helping uh, find people or deliver goods. Uh, so we don't know, okay, well, if we had more widespread use of drones, how many lives would we have saved and how much uh, less damage would that be? We have no idea. Uh, but I think uh, when you see typhoons or hurricanes in other parts of the world in countries where drones are more uh, more readily available, I, I, yeah, I hope you will have Americans who think, well, why couldn't this have happened uh, during our last natural disaster? Or why can't I uh, – and this is not true, but in the next couple of years, you might – Imagine someone in, I don't know, Britain or Germany, uh, an American tourist saying, well, why can Germans, you know, get their stuff delivered from the air and where's my um, burrito drone in New York, right? Uh, And there are a lot of technical details here, right? You know, uh, so I'm being somewhat flippant, but uh, I hope there'll be pressure to um, make this a more open space. About burrito drones Uh and similar sorts of this drone is going to deliver this package to you. How realistic – are these in anything like 
the near term. Because so the if you think about it, what you've got, like you still – drones still, these aren't, these aren't like AI piloted. So you still mm -hmm. need someone piloting these things. So you're paying that person. Um, they, they don't have a terribly long range. They can't carry a ton of weight. So the half gallon or gallon of milk might be more of a problem than, you know, and even a burrito, if it's, I mean, if it's a burrito worth eating, it's going to wow, be heavier. It's going to be hefty, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Five that, pound burrito. <laughs> you know, versus, versus the, the burrito joint in New York City hiring a bicycle messenger. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't, uh, people listening, I think, should not get their hopes up for burrito drones anytime soon. Um, I, I sort of, God, the burrito drone is like a blister in my brain just because of my colleague Trevor Burris who loves to talk about burrito <laughs> drones and uh, I think, you know, he really likes burritos. Uh, and uh, I, I think the technology, you're right, so there's the weight issue, there's the battery issue, there's the skill required issue. There's also, you know, not to get too lawyery necessary, but, you know, if you drop a burrito on someone's head you could uh, cause a mess and uh, yeah. there's – yeah, a, a bicyclist is a bit of a safer, more traditional way of doing it. And I think people like to talk about pizza delivery drones and burrito drones and Amazon drones. Uh, we're a little bit away from this becoming an affordable, commonplace thing. Uh, I just want to be in a in a country with a regulatory space that just allows experiments to happen anyway. Uh, and you know, if it's if it's just the millionaires who can afford it or use it or are experimenting with it, that that's fine by me too. So if I can do the optimistic case scenario, it would be that that. So right now you have a lot of – you have billions and billions of dollars of capital being poured into uh, artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicle technology, right, on roads. That's actually a much, much, much harder nut to crack when it comes to autonomous vehicles than autonomous vehicles in the sky. It turns out there's less stuff up there to run into. You don't have people and bike messengers with burritos in their bags darting out in front of them. Caught, you know, the vehicle has to stop and recognize them. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure eventually one will hit a goose or something and you'll have a problem. But yeah. it's a much simpler problem because there's less stuff. It's in that range of space above the tree line but below where things are allowed to fly um, that's relatively empty. And as long as you have a system where they can communicate with each other, which is, again, something that's being developed with, with eight, you have a scenario in which – 99% of the objects in that space are all communicating with each other, are obeying rules of traffic, are creating kind of highways in the sky. That's an easier application than doing this in conjunction with a bunch of dumb cars driven by dumb human beings and you know, and dogs running out in front of cars and bike messengers, et cetera. And snow. So and <laughs> like in, in a world in which you are free to innovate in this space, you know, the FDA, FAA is not putting such um, tight restrictions on the tech. That's the place where you would expect this to happen first before AV uh, vehicles on the roads. And yet it might end up being the other way around, not because the, – despite the fact that the tech – case is actually easier. Now, as far as the financial situation, I mean, this is something Aaron brought up in our China episode, actually. We have a lot of built delivery infrastructure. There's a whole system of roads and vans and bicycles that are designed to get stuff from point A to point B. So you have to have a really compelling financial use case to make it worthwhile to send you know, a gallon of milk at a time all around the city. But if you can get there, I mean, there's a reason why there's all this money pouring in here, why Amazon's involved, Google's involved, and Walmart's getting involved in drone delivery experimentation. Is that if you're the first to crack it, it's a big deal. It could transform our lives. I mean, you can imagine someday, whether it's 5, 10, 20 years in the future, where you want a gallon of milk. Rather than waiting till next week's big grocery store trip, you just say, I want milk. You say, when you want it delivered, a drone comes out drops on a little dedicated landing pad with like an RFID tracker in it. It flew itself from a central depot. Um, it has kind of aerial highways that it flies along to deliver stuff. They're communicating with other drones. Um, it, would, it would change how we shop. It would change how we consume. It, it would really kind of dramatically change daily life. And the first company to really crack it stands to gain a lot, right? Yeah, I think this is a area like a lot of others. You know, at Cato, we're constantly saying things like this, but uh, we're not very good at predicting the future, right? And uh, I was just out in in San Francisco recently with my colleague uh, Diego, who 
in, in conversations made the the really interesting point that you know people in the 1960s and 70s uh, i think it was were, were making predictions about the future of work right and none of them could have predicted that currently in britain there are thousands and thousands of people who are employed as personal trainers right like the, <laughs> yeah. the world changes in ways that are unpredictable right. uh but that's kind of the exciting part right uh so I think this space, uh, but it behooves anyone looking at this space to have a bit of humility. Uh, we don't have all the answers, uh, but nonetheless, that shouldn't stop us from embracing how exciting it is. Yeah. This episode brought to you by the Personal Trainers Association of Great Britain. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, thank you for listening, and until next week, be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.